Okay, tonight's lesson, we're looking at it. it. We're still in the section on God's plan of salvation. And this is imputation, propitiation, and position. They're big names, but they're not really that complicated. And, and so if you're, we, we start and we think about all these, these terms. I don't want you to turn back in your little book, but there's a page there that lists all those theological terms. But let's do this. Let's, let's kind of review them, okay? Let's review the terms that we've seen so far. The first one is reconciliation, and that bringing two parties from hostility to harmony. And the biblical reconciliation is... Perfect God brings sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. Then we saw sin, and we said sin was rebellion or falling short of God's character and commands. It's rebellion or, or, or you know, or, or hostility or just falling short somehow of God. So that's what sin is, rebellion. Then we said spiritual death, and spiritual death is separation from God. Okay, that's all we wanted to put there. Then we looked at redemption, and we said redemption is just what? To purchase by paying a price. Then the word atonement. Now remember that when we talk about it from a biblical point of view, atonement means to cover over. Sometimes in a theological point of view, people use the atonement for the payment for sin. Now I don't really like that. In fact, I think when you look at it biblically, the, the, uh, the atonement is always a covering over. And so we talked about that. Then the, the three we looked at last week were expiation. What is that? That's to pay, payment of a penalty by another is substitution as you'd suffer a penalty or suffer something, uh, a payment f uh, for somebody else. And then regeneration, what is it? That's the act in which God gives spiritual life to those who believe. And then the last one was justification, and that was the act by which God declares righteous the believing sinner. So that's what we saw. That was kind of the review. You don't have to write down everything. You had it from in your other lesson and everything, but these are the terms. Now, let me tell you what's neat is when we get through tonight, if you went to that page that's the, it, the, and looked at those terms, you should know every one of them. And we started a few weeks ago, and we said, what are these words? What is reconciliation? What is redemption? What is atonement? What is expiation? What is justification? Well, even tonight, we're going to look at imputation, propitiation, and position. And, uh, you know, you make the joke, and you say, we're going to look at all those Asians. You know, the truth is, the Bible is full of these terms. And it's important that, and in fact, if you want to just, just turn to Romans chapter 4, that's where we're going to actually be looking. But the terms are all throughout the Scripture. In fact, if you went to Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4 and just read those two chapters, you would find a whole bunch of these terms. And, and that's why I think it's so important that believers know this. And let me just tell you, most people have never studied this. And if you started talking to somebody in town, just go talking, and you said imputation, propitiation, justification, expiation, they don't even know what you're talking about. But they're in the Bible, and we need to know them. So let's talk tonight as we start with <clears throat> imputation. To impute something, imputation, it's a special term. It was a banking term, and here's what the definition is. It is to credit from one account to another or to deposit to an account or to give credit. If I went to the bank, I'm going to erase this right here. If I went to the bank and I had a check for 100 bucks, and I went up to the teller and I said, here's my account number, put this in my, in my account, Technically, she imputes that, she credits it to my account. So when we talk about the term imputation, we're saying to credit something, to, to put something to our account, so to speak. That's one way to look at it. It was a first century banking term, and you'd go to the bank and you'd say, I would like to put this in the bank. So let's look at how this fits, and we see Paul uses the example of Abraham to show imputation. So turn to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and we'll start at verses 1 and 2. And notice what it says. It says, what shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? He reads this out and says, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? He goes on to say, for if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Let me tell you something. Can you boast before God for your works? No, no, because it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Can you boast before men for your works? Yes, yeah. That's why he says, if Abraham were justified, justified means what? Declared, declared righteous. If, just, if Abraham were declared righteous by his works, he could boast, but not before God, because you're not declared righteous before God by your works. You're declared righteous for God by what? 
by faith. Okay, now, watch what he goes on to say, okay? So he says, if, uh, in Romans 4, it says, in verses 1 and 2, he says, Abraham was not justified by his works, okay? It, it, he couldn't, he could, if he did, he could boast, but, but he can't boast. So look what it goes on to say. But what does the Scripture say? Now, isn't that the most important thing? Paul says, now, what does the Bible say? Abraham believed God, and it was what? Credited to him for righteousness. Look what this says. Abraham believed God, and it was counted, credited, imputed. That's the word. Imputed to him as righteousness. Righteousness at the moment of faith. So when Abraham believed God, what was credited to his account? And whose righteousness? God's righteousness or Christ's righteousness, whatever how you want to say it. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. So as you look at this, and the, I think you'll probably go to the top of the next page, and we realize that the Greek word logizomai, logizomai, literally means, it actually is the word I credit. It means, this, that's a, a, you know, that, that's a verb. It means to credit. And so it would mean if I said, Here's this, I put this on your account, I logizomai, I credited to your account. What was credited to Abraham the moment he believed? God's righteousness, okay? And this is imputation. Now, remember, justification, I mean, we're going to come back to this, but justification does what? Declares you righteous. But imputation makes you righteous. See, this one says, you're right. This one says, I'm making you right. I'm crediting to your account. What if God said, you have to have $1,000 in your account to go to heaven? And we'd say, we don't have any money. And he said, okay, the moment you believe, I credit you 1000 bucks." And you'd say, well, I got it then, right. Okay, he says you've got to be righteous to go to heaven, and you go. I'm not righteous. In fact, our righteousness is what filthy rags. So he says, okay, the moment you believe, I give you righteousness. Wow, I love it. Don't you love this? Okay, now let me show you something you're going to absolutely really love. Okay, in the Bible there are uh, God imputes this righteousness to us. In the Bible there are three great imputations in the Word of God. Three great imputations. I'm going to give you all three, and then I'll come back and go details. Here they are. The first one is Adam's sin imputed to mankind. Adam's sin was credited to who? To all of us, right? Okay, look at the second one. Mankind's sin is imputed to Christ. Now, some of them we like and some of them we don't like. Here's the third one. Christ's righteousness is imputed to the believer. That's the three great imputations in the Scripture. So let me erase this off and let's, let's look at it. And this is, you're going to love it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay, everybody got those three written down? Okay, so let's look at the first one. And this is Adam's sin is it credited to mankind? Romans 5, 12. If you're in Romans 4, just flip. If your Bible's like mine, flip just a page or two pages. Mine's just one page. I want you to see verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, as just through one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so, all, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. How did everybody sin? Because Adam sinned. So let's put it this way. Here's Adam. His sin is imputed to mankind, to all people. That means technically we all have, remember we said how are we are sinners? We said we're sinners in three ways, imputed sin, inherent sin, and personal sin. Imputed sin is Adam's sin credited to our account. We go, well, I don't really like that one. Because see, when Adam sinned, it says, just remember, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. We got his sin. 
And we'd say, wait, wait a minute. I wasn't in the garden. I didn't do that. Well, the truth is, if we were in the garden, we would have done it. But the bottom line is, his sin is imputed to us. Now, we'd say, I don't really like that. That doesn't seem fair. So the football team lines up, and the, wh- the guy blows the whistle and says, okay, you can run the play. And just before they run the play, the right guard jumps offside. And so they say, well, he's the only one that's got to go back five yards. Right? No, the whole team goes back five yards. And you say, well, that's not really fair. I didn't jump offside. He was the one that jumped offside. Yeah, everybody is affected by that one. Everybody is affected by Adam's sin. Okay, that's the first one. Now let's look at the second one. The second one is this. And that is Adam, the, the sins of every human being, mankind's sins, were placed on to the account of Christ. He died to pay for all sin. First Peter 2, 24, he bore in his body our sins. Second Corinthians 5, 21, for God hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So here's the second thing. Watch this. It's Jesus on the cross. This is our sins were placed on Jesus on the cross. We all say Jesus died on the cross to pay for our what? Sins. The every sin of every human being is imputed to Christ, credited to Christ. Adam's sin went to us. Our sins went to Christ. Now, we like that one, don't we? We're not mad about that one. We go, that's good, that's good, I like that one. Uh, All we like sheep have gone astray, each one our own way, but the Lord hath laid on him all our iniquities. That's Isaiah 53, 6. God has laid on him all our iniquities. 1 Peter 2, 24, he bore our sins in his body. So our sins were placed on Jesus Christ. Now here's the best of all, the best of all, the third one. Christ's righteousness It's to the believer, Romans 4, 5. When we believe, we are credited with the righteousness of God. So here's the third one. This is the believer, and this is righteousness. And the moment we believe, Christ's righteousness is credited to us. So Adam's sin to mankind, mankind's sins to Jesus... Jesus' righteousness to the believer. Now, this happens whether we wanted it to happen or not. This happens whether we wanted it to happen or not. But this happens only when you believe. So if you want to be righteous, you have to believe because by faith we are, we are made righteous. Uh, we, when we, it's, we're credited with righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says, being found in Christ Not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but the righteousness of God, which is on the basis of faith. Now, think what that said. I'm in Christ. I don't have my own righteousness, but I have righteousness based on the fact that Christ has given me his righteousness. So if I said to you, are you all, all of you in this room, are you perfectly righteous? What's the answer? Yes. Why? Because credit is to your account. In fact, if you look at my record book, Where's my sin? See, it says JB, and it says sins. And the answer, there's zero. I go, (laughs) right? But that doesn't save me, right? Because absence of sin doesn't mean righteousness. But if I look on my account, I have plus righteousness. That's why I get to be with Jesus. That's why you get to be with Jesus. He has already taken your sin away as far as the east and the west, and he has given to you, deposited to your account, his righteousness. Wow. Uh, it's, it's just beautiful righteousness. So to see that, um, look, look at, um, uh, once again, Romans 4, 3, it says, let me flip back over there, go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 3. It says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was what? Imputed credited to him as righteousness. So that means all the way back, as far back as you can think, when somebody believed, God credited to their account righteousness. Now see, this idea is, you've got to remember, Jesus was the Lamb of God slain, uh, slain when? Before the foundation of the world. So you you just got to understand how it fits. Even though Jesus hadn't actually come and died yet, when a person believed, they got his righteousness. Now this part hadn't happened yet. Okay, 
So that's the imputations. Now, here's something I want you to see. Look at verse 4. Now, to him who works, his wage is not credited, it's not imputed as a favor, but as what is due. What does that mean? The one who works, his wage is earned. Listen, if you work at the end of the month and your boss came in and said, you know, thank you for all month and everything, I'd like to give you a gift. You'd say, well, that's not really a gift. Why? Because I work for it. I mean, I work for it. You've you got to give me that whether you want to or not because you're not giving me a gift. I've worked for a whole month, and you're giving me my paycheck. So he says, to the one who works, his wage is not deposited, credited as a favor. It's not a gift, but it's what's due. But look at the next verse. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is what? Credited for righteousness. The one who does not work, but believes his faith is imputed for righteousness. We get God's righteousness just by faith. Think about it because it's not, it's not whether a person works hard or tries to be a good person. Because remember, righteousness doesn't come by works. In fact, uh, it's, it's a gift. Righteousness comes by faith. It's a gift. So the one who does not work, his faith is counted for righteousness. He goes on and says... For the, uh, for the one who, who, who does not work but believes, his faith is credited for it. And he goes on and talks about David said the same thing. David said, blessed is the man that God gives righteousness apart from works. That's David, King David. And so some really great things. Righteousness comes by faith apart from works. Just remember that. There's all kind of people out there trying to do good to somehow think they can earn their way to God. And there's no possible way to do that. Philippians 3, 9, I quoted that one a while ago, uh, being found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which comes on the basis of faith. God gives us the righteousness he demands. Have you ever thought about that? God says, if you want to be with me, I've already removed all your sin, but that doesn't make you to be able to be with me. And we could say, well, why not? He said, because you've got to be as righteous as I am. We go, well, that's for sure I ain't. That's right. So here's what I'm going to do. When you believe, I'm going to give you the righteousness. I'm going to put it in your account. I'm going to go to your bank, and I'm going to say, deposit to JB my righteousness. And so I got it. And you have it too. So if you notice, justification does what? Declares us righteous. Saint imputation does what? Makes us righteous. Now, it happens at the same time. I don't want you to think that you believe and he justifies you and says, I declared you righteous, but you're not righteous. And a little bit later on, I'm going to give you my righteousness. No, it all happens the exact moment you believe. All of these things happen. Okay, does this make sense? How about questions or comments or anything on imputation? Anything? Are we glad that he imputes to our account his righteousness? Are we glad that he took our sin? Now, we're not so glad about the first one, but even if that sin wasn't there, you know what we'd do? We'd personally sin all over the place, right? And, and then, uh, so I'm so glad that Jesus took my sin. Okay, so that's the first one. That's imputation. Let's look at the next one. Now, this is a big name, propitiation. And when you say propitiation, what does that mean? Propitiation deals with satisfaction. You know that song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction? You remember that one? Well, this, you can't, God gets satisfaction. And get, in fact, God is satisfied. In fact, what we want to do, the definition is this. Propitiation is the, a satisfactory payment. If I owed Brent $100, and he said, you need to pay me. And I said, well, I, can't, I don't have the money right now. And he said, you need to pay me. And Kevin said, wait a minute. And he gave and handed you the $100. He said, now, are you satisfied? And you say, yeah, I'm, the payment's been made. And I say, well, I owe you $100. He said, no, you don't owe me $100. It's already paid. What do we owe God? What did Jesus do for us? Died for us. He paid the penalty. See, satisfactory payment is a payment that's satisfied. We owed God death. Jesus said, I will die in their place. He took our place. That's the substitution part, but this is the satisfactory payment part. As I told you, they all go together. Jesus' payment 
turned away or satisfied the wrath of God. It's, it's just amazing. that God must be satisfied. We have to think about it in that sense. And so we're going we're gonna to see that. Let me see what I've got here. This has, there's nothing we can do to satisfy God. He's already satisfied. I have to tell you this story, and I don't know if I told it in here or not. I think I told it once at church, but there's an old story about Harry Ironside was uh, going around. He was at the it, you know, early 20s, he was preaching, and he was proclaiming the gospel message, and he got, he became famous, and people were hearing him, and they were saying, I want to go hear him talk, and I want to know about the message, and one night, a man supposedly came very, at the very end, and missed everything, it was all over, and so he, he said, I'm going to wait and talk to Dr. Ironside after it's over with, and he waited and waited, and then with Dr. Ironside at the over, he went to Dr. Ironside and said, Dr. Ironside, I missed everything, tell me what I need to be able to do to satisfy God, and Dr. Ironside said, you're too late. And the guy went, no, nah, I know I missed the meeting. I know I'm too late for the meeting, but tell me what I got to do. And Ironside looked back at him and said, you're too late. You can't satisfy God. And the guy went, kind of went like, you got to help me. And he said, listen, you can't satisfy God because he's already satisfied. Jesus did it all. You can't satisfy him. God has already been satisfied through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. See, there's nothing we can do to satisfy God. That's why people are out there trying to be good, trying to go to heaven, <coughs> trying to do all these things. They think somehow they're going to satisfy God. And he says, no, no, no. <coughs> the satisfaction, the payment is what? What is the payment? It's death and separation. If you want to satisfy God, you got to be dying to be separated from him forever. And so he said, no, 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 the, uh, we, we, got it. We, can, we can come up with all the goodness we've got, but that's not going to be the thing that satisfies. So I want you to look again now at Romans chapter 3. We've been in Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5, and now back to chapter 3. And I want you to look at verses 23, 23 22, 23. You, you know the verses where uh, he's talked about... Uh, All have sinned, you know, this famous part. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, look at these words. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, what, is sin one of our words? Right? And then look at the next word, being justified as a gift. Is justified one of our words? By his grace, through, his, through the redemption. Is redemption one of our words? Which is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth publicly as a propitiation. Is that one of our words? Do you realize that just in two Verses, we have four of those biblical terms that we're learning, that we're making sure we got. So I want you to see that he begins by saying that in Romans 3.20, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. In fact, that, that we're justified. Notice, I love this though. We're declared righteous as a gift by grace through the redemption, the purchase, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says these famous words, whom God displayed Publicly as a what? What's the word? Are y'all there? And what does propitiation mean? So listen to this. God displayed Christ as a satisfactory payment in his blood through faith. Jesus is what? Jesus is the satisfactory payment. God set forth Jesus as a satisfactory payment. Now, that's something you just got to grasp this. He's the propitiation. And, and, I would, and I always just, you know, I tell people, a lot of times when I read 1 John 2, 2, it's even in church, I won't say propitiation because I know that there are people sitting out there, even though the scripture actually says he's the propitiation, I sometimes will say he's the satisfactory payment because people grasp that. They understand what a satisfactory payment is. If I had to come up with $1,000 and I had the $1,000, that would be a satisfactory payment. God says, no, the satisfactory payment is death and separation. And we say, well, I, I don't, can't pay that. And he says, no, Jesus did pay it. I am satisfied because Jesus Christ has done it all. Look at this, 1 John 2, 2. Now, look, he says, Jesus is the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the what? Sins of the entire world. Now, just think about that. We talk about this all the time, and we say, here's Jesus on the cross, and he did what? He paid for what? For all sin. For all sin for every person, 1 John Two, two. But the point of this verse, when he says it, he is the satisfactory payment. God is satisfied. He's satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. 
He's the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. I want you just to take a second <clears throat> and turn to 1 John chapter 4, okay? Just turn all the way to the back of the Bible to 1 John chapter 4. Okay, and I want you to see this. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. God showed his love by sending Jesus to be the satisfactory payment for our sins. Now watch this. Let's read it together. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. It says, by this, by what? Well, he's going to tell us. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. By this, God's love was shown to us that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. This is how it says, this is how I show my love. I showed my love that I would send my Son that you might live. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the what? What does it say? Propitiation for our sins. That means he's the what for our sins? Satisfactory payment. So God says, I love you so much, I'm sending my Son to be the payment for your sins. What can you do to please God? He is already pleased. He is the satisfactory payment. And, and I, we like to put this down this way. God is satisfied with the death or the payment of Christ. So at the very bottom of that page, you can write, God is satisfied with the death of, of Jesus Christ and the payment for our sins. Now, these, these terms, if you really think about it, are, are pretty incredible. The moment we believe God credits to our account righteousness. The moment we believe God declares us righteous. The moment we believe he does what? He, we, 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 whether we believe or not, he is the satisfactory payment for our sins. In a minute, when we get to the end, and we're, this is not a long lesson, so we may, we may get out early, which is okay, I'm sure, with everybody. But the bottom line is when we, when we look through this, we're going to go through all these terms in just a minute, and we're going to say, wow, look how they all fit together. Remember we said that the, the message of salvation is so simple that what? A child can understand it. A five-year-old can understand that Jesus loves them and died for them and that if they believe in him, they get to be with him forever. They get eternal life. They may not understand all that, but they can understand being with Jesus forever and it's just by faith and it's not their works or their goodness or trying to be a good little boy or girl. It is what Jesus has done for them. And so a child can understand that. But all these terms that we've been going over these weeks, they're all technical terms. And they're theological terms. And people could look at this and go, I don't know what propitiation means. I don't know what imputation means. I don't know what justification means. I don't know what expiation means. And yet, those are technical things that all come together that go right back to the same message. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and whoever believes in him has eternal life. And so let's, let's get the last one, and then we'll get a little bit more detail. The last one is the position. Now, this is really simple. Our position, and I, I don't know how I, I, well, I lost a page, I think. On, well, I may have lost my page. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's talk about position. Position is our identification. I put this, this th I didn't do these slides. This slide says position is our identification or union with Christ. Actually, if you want to just say our position is our identification or union. You don't have to put with Christ because we have a position before we're in Christ. Okay? So our identification, and you can just put what is position. It's our identification or our union. Okay? Does that make sense? So you don't have to write all of that one. And so I want you to, to think about it this way. Before salvation, we are what? identified in Adam. If therefore, if anyone is in Adam, in Adam all die. We come into this world, if you remember, we come into this world with a body and a soul and a conscience and a flesh, and our identification is in Adam. 
That's who we're connected with. In fact, there's an idea that people say that when God looks at human beings, they're either in Adam or in who? Christ. And of course, if you're in Christ, you're a what? A new creation. And you have a body and a soul and a conscience and a flesh and a spirit, a human spirit. We'll just put human spirit. And then you have the Holy Spirit. And so when we came into this world, we came in in Adam. And the Bible says in Adam, everybody dies. In Adam, that's our position. But when we trust in Jesus Christ after salvation, we're identified in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Paul uses in Christ 55 times in his 13 letters. He says, in Christ. He says that identification, that union, that is so powerful for us. And so uh, I think I have it right there. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, our union is in Christ, he's a new creation. So when you think about yourself, you're either, people, every human being is either in Christ or in Adam. And if they're in Adam, what happens in Adam? Whoops, let me go back. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. Now, that's all people. In Adam, all die. If a person never, if a person never believes in Jesus Christ and is placed in Christ, he will be in Adam and he will die. We come into this world spiritually what? And then, if something doesn't happen, we're going to die physically. There's a physical death. And then there's what we call the second death, which is separation from God forever. And so, in Adam, if you stay in Adam, you are not only spiritually dead, you will die physically, and then there will be the second death, which is eternal separation from God. That's what death is, separation. If you're in Christ, if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. And in Christ, there is eternal life. And you will spend eternity. So there's either the second death or there's eternal life. And every human being is in one or the other. And that's why when it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we've all been placed in Christ. You know, we've been baptized into Christ. Baptized means to be connected, to be in union. And so we've been in union with Christ. Sinful man who was identified with Adam is now identified with and placed in Christ. So where are you? You're what? You're in Christ. Let me ask you a question. Where are you really? You're in Christ, right? Where is he? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Where are you? You're seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where you are positionally. I mean, it sounds a little weird, but here's the Father. Here's the right hand of the Father. Here's Jesus. And you're going, here I am. It's true. We don't always think about it that way. Now, I want to show you something I think you're going to love. And um, so look at, look at Ephesians. Just turn to Ephesians chapter 1 for a second. You got Galatians, then Ephesians, and Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to go over something for you. And then I want us to see the terms. Okay, in Ephesians, look at chapter 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Why, why in the heavenlies? Because where are we? In the heavenlies. And notice what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies where? What does it say? In Christ. Okay, so you're connected in Christ, and he says, what do you have? Spiritual blessings. And he's going to name some of them. I just wanted you to see something. In Ephesians 1, look. 
that with the guy, in verse 3, he says you've got spiritual blessings. I want you to notice, look at verse 7. What are the spiritual blessings? In him, in Christ, what do we have? What does he say? We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have redemption. Look at verse 10 and 11, especially verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose to works all things after the counsel of his will. If you go back to the end of verse 10, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance. So what do you have because of your connection with Christ? An inheritance. Look at this one right here. Verse 13. Security. Look at verse 13. How does it start? In him, right? Is that what it says? In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having what? Believed you were what? Sealed with him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Look at what you have because of your found in Christ. You have spiritual blessings. You have redemption. You have an inheritance. You have security. And I got one more that I want you to see. Turn to chapter 2. Look at, ver- and here I'll just put it up here. 5 and 6. We've been raised up and seated in Christ in heavenly places. Look what he says. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. Actually, many manuscripts read, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you've been saved through faith, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places. Where? Where? In Christ Jesus. I want you to write these down. I want you to remember them. That because of our connection with Jesus Christ, and we're in him, we were in Adam, we're now in Christ, we have spiritual blessings, we have redemption, we have inheritance, we have security, and we're raised up, and we're seated in Christ Jesus. Wow. That's because you're in Christ. That's your position. You remember we talking about this at different times? I I see Charlene gets all excited about this, because it's really true. That people go through our Christian lives, and what do we think? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's wrong. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You're a new creation in Christ. You've been raised up. You're seated in heavenly places. You're secure. You have an inheritance. You've been redeemed. You have every spiritual blessings. You have all of this given to you by God. And we're not even talking now about spiritual gifts and the Word of God and fellow believers and all these other things. And so we go through life as if we're just miserable. Prof. Hendricks used to say, uh, I wish somebody would tell these so-called happy Christians to, to let their face know, you know, because they walk around as if we're all sad, and we should be walking around saying, you know who I am? I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm raised up and seated in the heavenly places. I'm secure in Christ. I have an inheritance that is undefiled, kept forever by me, by, by, by Christ for me. I have been redeemed, and I have every spiritual blessing. Who are you? You're found where? In Christ. Don't ever forget who you're in. You're not here. If you're here, you're dead. And you're going to be dead forever, separated from God. In here, you're alive. You have a spiritual life, an eternal life, and a new creation in all of the blessings. Wow. Okay, now let's do this. Let's think about the terms, okay? Let's see what we can do. What is reconciliation? Okay, to bring harmony, bring people back together. Ryrie says it is a change from hostility to harmony between two parties. And biblical reconciliation is the perfect God brings sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. What is sin? It is rebellion or defection from God's character or commands. Rebellion or defection from God's character or commands. Now, all we're doing is going down that chart that was back over there about chapter 10 that we all looked at and said, here's these terms we're going to learn, and now we know them, right? We know what reconciliation is. We know what sin is. What about what is spiritual death? I mean, you're separated from God, and we come into this world separated from God. We can't really know him. And if something doesn't happen, we're ultimately going to be separated from him forever. What does redemption mean? What? Purchased by paying a price. What did Jesus do? He redeemed us. How? He bought us where? In the, stock, in the slave market, right? Right? 
and, and he brought us out, and he set us free. Now, when it says set free there, remember, it's not set free like I do anything I want. It's set free to what? To serve. Okay, so, well, we got reconciliation and sin and spiritual death and redemption. What is atonement? It means to cover. And we said that in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, I mean, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices of animals did what? Cover sin, because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But Jesus Christ came as the great high priest and offered himself as the final sacrifice for sin forever, went into the tabernacle in heaven, poured out his blood, and was the payment. And we'll, we'll, talk, we, we'll know that coming. But so, Jesus is in the atonement. Now, if you use it as a theological term, what does the term atonement mean? It, huh? it means a payment. But I'm using it as a biblical term. Be careful. What t- translation did you use? There's, there's a translation that says 1 John 2, 2. He, we say he is the satisfactory payment. He's the propitiation. Some, some actually says he's the atoning sacrifice. Now, if you take that biblically, what does atoning sacrifice mean? A covering. Jesus isn't a covering sacrifice. He's a payment. Okay? Okay, so that's atonement. Uh, what is Expiation. Huh? It's substitution. It's suffering a penalty or uh, something for somebody else. What did Jesus do for us? He died in our place. Give me a verse. Huh? Romans 5. God demonstrates love toward us. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hebrews 2 9, he suffered death for every person. 1 John 2 2, he's the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. So it's all over the Bible, okay? And then we got regeneration. What is regeneration? It's the act by which God gives what? Spiritual life to the believer. You got it. It, this, is, this is regeneration right here. Dead, alive. No spirit, no spirit. Because we, Adam and Eve had a body, a soul, and a... Body and a soul and a spirit. No, Adam and Eve had a body and a soul. And then they died spiritually because he said, in the day that you eat that fruit... You're going to die. Die and you shall surely die. Die in spirit, you'll die physically. They died spiritually and then ultimately died physically. So they were spiritually alive, then they were dead, and then whoever believes is now spiritually alive again. That's why unbelievers, you can't, when you talk to unbelievers, you don't get off on even some of these issues. And you don't talk about Jonah and the whale, and you don't talk about Genesis, and you don't. You go straight to the gospel message. You continually tell them how Jesus died and rose again, and whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. Why? Because the Holy Spirit convicts them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, sin that they have not, what? Believed. So you want to stay on the issue, because an, a spiritually dead person, the Holy Spirit's convicting them of the fact that they haven't believed. So you don't want to get off on these other issues. You want to keep going back to what will they do with Jesus? Will they believe in him for eternal life? That's why you stay on that issue. Because that's what the Holy Spirit's convicting them of, okay? Uh, regeneration, being born again, made alive, born from above. Justification is to be declared righteous. And it's all throughout the Bible that when you believe, God declares you right, okay? Okay? And then, here we go. What's imputation? To credit to account. What, what, give me the three imputation, the big, three big imputations in the Bible, beginning with Adam. Adam's sin was what? Imputed to mankind. Mankind's sins were imputed to Christ on the cross, and Christ's righteousness is imputed to the believer. You don't get his righteousness unless you believe. So imputation is God giving his righteousness to us. We got to be thankful for that. Because the bottom line is, the payment for sin sort of brings you up to the level of nothing, (laughs) right? You're sinful, he pays for the sins, but you don't have righteousness. Righteousness comes by faith. What is propitiation? Okay, so Jesus is the satisfactory payment. Give me a verse. 1 John 2, 2, he's the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. Uh, there's a lot of places that talk about it, even the first John where he says that he's the propitiation. So I I love it. Um, Even the Old Testament Hebrew has an idea of uh, uh, the mercy seat. The mercy seat was a propitiation place where there was a satisfaction there. Okay, now we know that in the Old Testament everything was covered, but there was still satisfaction. Okay, and then position. What's our position? Okay, we were... In Adam, which is what? Death. 
And now we're in Christ, which is life. And all those blessings. What were some of those blessings? Huh? An inheritance? Redemption? What was the other one? What did you say? Security? Raised up and seated with Christ and all the spiritual blessings. Well, they all fit together. So it's so simple that even a child can... And look at this. Look at that. How many people do you think, if you could walk out of this room, just talk to somebody you know, the mother of some kid that y'all are, the father, and you start saying, do you know what these words mean? They're in the Bible. Is... is uh, being found in Christ, that's in the Bible. Propitiation is in the Bible. Imputation is in the Bible. It's sometimes credited. Justification is all over the Bible. Regeneration is born again. It's in the Bible. Expiation, it, it's not necessarily that word is there, but the idea of substitution is there. Atonement is there. Redemption is there. Spiritual death is there. Reconciliation is there. Second Corinthians five seventeen through 21, reconciliation is used like four or five times. I mean, sin, sin's pretty much found in the Bible, I think. So, I mean, think about this. Think about all these terms that are biblical terms that you know, that you know. And uh, it's, it's powerful. Okay, here's some. This is, for, this is for a woman. You come back for Christmas, so you got plenty of time to memorize this. But First John 4, 9, and 10. By, the, by, by this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son in the world, that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the what? Propitiation for our sins. And then here's the Romans 4, 5. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is what? Credited as righteousness. That's imputation. So it's pretty powerful. 